And joining us now on the MetaShare guest line is former NBA player and current director of player development at Auburn, his alma mater in the NBA. He played from 2003 to 2013 for the Mavs, Pacers, Celtics, and Bucks. He's Marquise Daniels. Marquise, thanks so much for joining us here on Unpacking It. How are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Um, I'm doing great, and and I'm loving the NBA playoffs, and and so I know you're you're now involved in the college game. But but how much are you watching of the NBA playoffs, and and how intrigued are you by it all? I watch. I try to catch every game if I can. Um, it's it's been real interesting. You know, these guys have been playing really some really good basketball lately. So, you no, know, other than the last two games, or maybe last night, the Sixers and and um, who else that was? Some your, your, your Mavs. Your Mavs. The awesome. Mavs, yeah, they 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 came out. With, you know, they didn't have great effort, but you know, they they play hard. It's been a good series so far. Both both series been good. Absolutely. So you played for a number of teams in the NBA. Is, is there one team that you're you're most loyal to, or or one that you're most connected to at this point? Uh, I think I kind of left a niche everywhere I went, so I'm I'm kind of connected to every team. You know, cool. I try not to burn any bridges, no matter where you are. You try to leave them good grace and good standards with every team you play for. So I, I just like to see good basketball, and I still stay in contact with a lot of those people that was there, from the trainers and the you know the owners and everyone else. Oh, that's excellent. That's a that's a great reminder for us all not to not to burn bridges. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, well. So as far as the you know the teams in, in this year's playoffs, is there a team that you kind of feel the best about? You're like, ah, they're the they're the championship favorites at this point. Man, I think whoever's going to be healthy. Yeah, Man, I think that's going to be the biggest thing right now. Um, just being healthy, you know. Uh, you know the Bucks, they won it last year, so you can't count them out. But they're they're banged up a little bit. Chris Middleton's not there. Um, Celtics are playing good. Um, Phoenix is looking good. Dallas is looking good. So it's you no, know, and then you can't count out Golden State. So it's it's a lot of good teams out there. There's still some good basketball out there, and I think it's just a matter of who's going to be healthy at the end. It, it really is, and it's it, it's been kind of that story so far. Guys in and out of the lineups, and uh, the the series have switched based on injuries as as well as as we've seen. Exactly. Well, as, as you think back about uh, you know your time in the NBA, and especially some some great runs in the playoffs. What are some of those those memories that 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 come to mind as you think back? Um, just you know, when you win, you feel like you're never gonna lose again, and when you lose, it's like, man, are we gonna win again? <laughs> so it's just um, you know, just staying the course and you know, just like really taking care of your home court. You got to make sure you win the games at home and try to steal you one or two on the road if you can. But you know, just locking in on the game plans, understanding you know what players like to do, their tendencies and they really being keying in on what, what you have to do when it's your time out there on the court. It, it seems like, I mean, I guess this is true in all sports. I mean, home field is such a, a big advantage. Home court is such a big advantage. But what is it about the NBA playoffs where it really is so important about winning winning at home and, and it's almost like the, the role players change so much kind of based on being home in a way? What, what was your experience with, with that? Um, you know, home court is huge, but like you said uh, about the um, the role players, role players win a lot of games in the playoffs. That's right. You know, they 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 keying in on the major players so much that you need those players that you know may not get as much attention to come in and and get you some good minutes and some good points, some good defense, or whatever it is it takes for them. And role players play a major key in winning some playoffs games. At, no, no question. It's the X factors and who's going to get hot and who's coming off the bench and, and hits hits those big shots for sure. Exactly. Well, all right. I want to hear uh, about your kind of journey. We'll, we'll talk basketball, then we'll we'll talk faith and, and intertwine both. Uh, but but your your playing career ended in in 2013, and and so how did that transition out of the NBA go for you? What what were kind of the the next steps after playing? What did you pursue, and and how how was that season of life for you? Uh, you know, at first it was, it wasn't bad. It was, it's kind of weird at first. You know, a lot of people think like, man, I'm done. I'm retired. I get to relax. You know, my whole thing was like, I want to take my kids to school and pick them up from school. You know, all that, all the fun stuff, the dad stuff. And it's like, once you're done and you, you so accustomed to getting up at a certain time, you know, coming in, you know, at a certain time from games and practices, like you on a schedule to now it's like, you got a lot of free time. You can do this and do that. And you're not around you know, the, the players, the camaraderie and everything. And it's just like, 
it's a big adjustment. And it was a time from, say, maybe maybe about three, four months, I was, like, dealing with, like, anxiety, depression type stuff that I didn't even know I was dealing with because you, I don't know the symptoms of all that stuff. So I was like, man, what is wrong with me? And I'm trying to figure it out. You know, um, you know, even I went to the hospital a couple of times trying to figure out what was going on. I was like, are you dealing with anxiety and depression? I'm like, nah, I'm not dealing with that stuff. Like, what are you talking about? And I come to find out that I just needed to get back around the game and be back around, you know, the whole atmosphere of basketball, being around things that you love and what you're accustomed to. And I think that a lot of players, whether it's basketball, football, but whatever sport it is, or whatever it is that you do majority of your time, once you retire, you have to make sure that you're prepared for having so much time and making sure you have something that you can do that can keep you busy because being free is like it, it's the devil's playground i mean yeah it, it can it can come at you in ways and you be thinking about stuff that you can't even control and you be like what am i doing like what is wrong with me and you have no idea about what's going on until you like really sit back and understand that you know it's it's all a, a setup it's like you set up to get to this certain level and then all of a sudden here comes the enemy mm. trying to take you down and bring you back down to like, nah, you ain't nothing. You this and that, but you have accomplished this and did this and that. But now he's here to remind you that, no, you're nothing. So you have to have a strong faith in God and everything to keep moving forward. Wow, man. No, I appreciate you you sharing that. And and oftentimes, you know, as fans, we're, we're watching guys play and we're, you know, whoever's on the court, that's who we're thinking right. about. And then, you know, guys come and go in the league and, and, you guys have to keep living your life. I mean, you yeah. got to announce the, the next phase. Um, and so at what point after that did you start thinking about coaching? And and then what was the story ultimately where, you, where you've now ended up back at Auburn? Um, well, my wife, she was um, coaching basketball in, in Georgia at Southwest High School in Macon. So I would go up there, you know, kind of, you know, hang around a little bit. You know, I was working my daughter out. She's good, good, really good at basketball. My son, he loves baseball. So even though he can play bas ba basketball, he loves baseball. So I, I didn't know much about baseball. I was learning that on the fly. But, oh, wow. you know, I was going out there with her, with my daughter, and, you know, just showing her some stuff. And and uh, I used to come back to Auburn a lot, to a lot of games and everything, just, you know, come back, being around the team. And, and Coach Pearl asked me, he, asked, he asked me that if I want to, you know, you know, come back and coach and help get involved with the program. And I was like, sure. And he gave me a chance to come back, and I was able to get my master's. And come back and just join the team and join the program. And I've been here going on my fifth year next year. Man, and so what what has the experience been like? And and kind of what what do you see as your sweet spot in the the coaching and development of players? What 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 makes you uh effective, I guess? Um, man, it's, it's you don't realize how much you know until you're you're out of and then you put in a situation to have to deal with younger kids that very talented but don't really understand how to play the game and how to deal with everyday life, things of life, you know, the aspects. And, you know, me dealing with my player development side of things is I do a lot of stuff on the court, helping them on the court, but a lot of stuff I help the kids with is stuff they deal with off the court. You know, like we have players that's, you know, some kids, they from overseas, but I make sure, hey man, call your dad today, call your mom today, call your parents. You know, making sure they stay in contact because as a coach, you're focused on winning. And very seldom do you see if this kid is actually going through depression or going through anxiety because you're locked in, you're focused on, you know, making the team better. You don't really – not saying you don't focus in on a single player, but sometimes you don't have time to just really necessarily focus in on one or two players. Here. Now, you got to try to make sure the team is good. So that's where I come in. And I can talk to the guys, you know, not as a coach, but as a person of, that's been through what you're trying to get to. And, you know, just trying to help you out in everyday life, whether it's – basketball, school, social media, you know, just trying to help them out with everything, everyday life, dealing with, like, a lot of these kids, they deal with a lot of stuff back home that they try to put together and try to put behind them and focus on what they got to do on the basketball court. And, that you know, a lot of times they get com com um, misconstrued that people don't care what they have going on off the court. They only think people care about what they're doing for them on the court. And so that's why I come in, you know, just talk to me, man, what you got going on? Because a lot of times, Kids don't want to go to the coach because they look at the coaches like that's the police. I can't go tell coach something. Ah. I can't tell him this and that. So you can come talk to me. I'm not gonna go tell coach everything. I'm gonna give him a little bit to let him know, like, look, hey man, you should maybe you should go talk to him and see how he's doing to keep everybody, you know, like some of them be here and some there. So I try to, you know, get a find a way to bring them here to where everybody's on a 
on a smooth pass. I, I call myself the fire extinguisher. You know, before the problems get to the coach, I try to put them out and help him, you know, as well as, you know, keeping these kids understanding that, hey, man, it's a bigger goal than just basketball right now. Just keep focusing on what you have to do on the court, and I'll help you with everything off the court. Wow, that, that's a cool and, and such an important role to have. So the player development role, and it seems like that role has has kind of taken off more and more over the years in, in college and even pro and, and right. football, basketball, whatever sport it may be. Um, and, and looking at athletes in, in the, the totality of, of who, who they are, um, right. which is, which, which is great. And, and I think too, kind of what you're saying too, you're, you're still connected to the team, but you're also somewhat disconnected right. to where it is a safe place for them to, to be able to share, exactly. uh, which, which is great. So for you then kind of growing up, as you think back when, you know, you were in college and, and even in, in the pros, who were those people that came alongside you? And even who were some of those coaches that, that had the biggest impact on you th throughout uh, your Indian days? You know, in college, it was Coach Charlton Young. He was, uh, he's, uh, he was at FSU. He just went over to Missouri. He used to help me out a lot. Uh, but as far as someone just being the way that I am with these kids hands-on, we really didn't have it back then. Hmm. So now it's like, you know, just like I wish I had this type of stuff. So now I try to give it to them to help them to understand that look. I mean, I've been through what you're trying to go through. I understand what, you, what it is. Like, sometimes as a player, you know what, like, man, I just don't have it today. I don't feel good today. And a coach is not like, man, you need to do this and do that. So now you have to help them to understand what the coach is thinking and why the coaches want you to do it this way. And so he, could, I could break it down to him from a player's perspective. So now he could understand it better than, you know, the coach just it feel like, coach, you just beat know me. Like, no, he's <laughs> actually trying to help you to be a, be a better person and you know it's, it's a difficult thing for them to understand because they're young and you know they're talented but at the end of the day they're still kids no question about it well well that last thing on on auburn jabari smith one of the top players coming out in, into the the nba draft and so you've obviously spent spent time with him what what do you i guess see in, in his potential for the nba and and kind of how does he fit fit in on the next level uh, man, he he has he has the it factor. He's gonna he's gonna be a special kid, you know. Um, just a great talent, all around great kid, hard worker, always willing to learn, you know. Just constantly asking questions, just want to get better. And I, I think if he keeps carrying those same attributes that he came in here with, and um, he's only gonna get better. He's gonna be a great player in the league for a long time. Yeah, he's gonna be fun fun to watch on, on the yeah. next level for for yeah. sure. I'm looking forward to it. Well, Marquise, we, we love talking basketball on the show, but but also lo love talking faith and, and hearing uh, different stories. And and so uh, would love to hear about your your faith journey and 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 kind of you know take us back to to who maybe who you once were and, and kind of your your Ooh. view of God and then how, how ultimately how is how has God transformed your your life uh, into to where your faith is at today? Uh man, I can I can. <laughs> I used to have gold teeth in my mouth. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I grew up a typical, you know, typical kid from, you know, the, the uh, urban areas in, you know, Florida. Um, just growing up, uh, early on, my my big mom, she uh, she she was the mother of the church, and my my grandfather before he passed, he was the um, the preacher, the pastor of the church, and you know, my big mom rest her soul, she passed recently. That they used to have me um, in church Wednesdays from six to uh, like two in the morning. And then oh. like on Sundays, we go to church from like 11 to four or five. It's one of those Baptist churches. We we're in there all day. And it's like growing up, I used to go stay with them in the summer and they didn't even have a TV in the house. It was just a radio and it was on AM station all the time. So we had no, no secular music. It was all church music. It was just, so I would like get up and leave the house early just to get out the house and just go play something, anything, go to my cousin's house, maybe look at TV, anything. And I mean, I think it, it helped me to later in life because, you know, as a, as a kid, you you walk with God. As you get older, in your teen years to mid-20s, 30s, you start straying away from him. And luckily enough, if you're able to get through that stage, you start coming back towards God, mm -hmm. you know, and, and understanding that, if you've been through a lot of stuff that you know that he's the reason why you're where you're at and you got to keep walking with him and keep building your faith and, you know, just keep praying, just staying strong with your faith and understanding that, you know, it, it you know, they say, um, the only way to make it is in is to think as a child, you know, to be as a child, you know, try to be free. And I understand the stresses of the world and, you know, having kids, bills and everything and all that type of stuff that 
can cause you to stray away and be like, man, I got to do what I got to do to take care of my family or whatever the situation may be. But you still have to keep your faith and understand that, you know, the devil's going to try. Mm. He's going to try hard. I mean, he's going to come at you in so many ways through family, through sports, through whatever the case may be. He's going to come at you. But you have to always find a way to keep giving God the glory and, and understand that no matter what. I mean, the problem, it may be big, but it's not bigger than your God at the end of the day. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. So, so for you then, what, what was kind of the, the, the path back to God? What, what, what kind of, what were some of the, the key moments or, or pivotal uh, seasons that, that, that drew you back to him? I, I, I never really was disconnected too far from him. I mean, I had some times, you know, and when I was playing, it's like, yeah, you know, you, you getting a lot of attention, a lot of people, you like, you kind of be like, all right, so you prayed about it. Now you want to forget about him, but you can't. You know, the things that he gives you, you got to, you know, make sure you appreciate him in the times that you have him and the times that you don't have him. So I think um, to answer your question, I was in, was it Boston maybe? I got, um, when I got my neck injury ah. and, you know, I was paralyzed on the court for about five minutes before, you know, and I'm just laying there and I'm just saying in my head the whole time, like, you know, the devil got to try harder than this. Like, you got to try harder than this. this. This can't be it. And, you know, um, just that, host- that ride to the hospital, you know, my nerves starting to fire back up. And it's like, man, y'all cut this jersey off me, get it off me. Like, that's probably the most pain I've ever been in. And then um, recently when I was here in, um, in Auburn, I got in a bad car accident. Uh, um, I was maybe five minutes away from home, hit a tree, knocked, oh. knocked the wheels off the front tire, front the, the wheels off my truck. It was some people sitting on the porch, and they was like, "We was in the, on the porch when you ran up in the yard and hit the tree." They had to cut me out. I woke up two hours away in Birmingham, you know, with my leg up, my hip slipping out of place, falling, coming out of my side. It was crazy. Like, and um, that was another situation of um, just like, "All right, you think you got it, but I'm still in control. Like, I, I'm still here. I'm still God." And it was just. Um, you know how they say, you know, your, your grandmother prayers are still working on you. That's right. You know, and it was just one of those situations. And I never forget before my big mom passed, she told me that. She said, you know how to do it. Now it's up to you to, to make it happen, to, to do it for yourself. And she was talking to me about praying, you know, and just making sure I cover my family. And so uh, if you follow me on any social media th- threads, you see that I'm pretty much up every morning at 5 a.m. You know, I, I put my top of the morning, then I put a Bible scripture after that, get my Bible reading in and try to cover my family and pray over my family every morning, you know, to keep that, that, that hedge surrounding us, you know, like God did with Moses um, in the Bible, you know, you know, a lot of people think that he had the hedge just in the back of him, but he had it in front of him also when they were going towards the Red Sea, you know, so when the Pharaohs came behind him, he moved that hedge around him. It wasn't just an overnight thing. It was something that, you know, it took time, but a lot of people don't understand that, you know, you got to get dig into the word. And I think a lot of people, we in a time where everybody believes what they hear instead of doing some research and understanding it for themselves. And it's kind of like, you have to do the same thing with getting to know God. Like I, I can't go off what you feel with God. I got to get to know God for myself. Amen. And I think that's something that a lot of people, we, we fall short on because it's like, Oh, he said it must be true. It might be true for him, but it might not work for you. So you got to go in there and you got to find what God is to you and how he can help you in ways and, you know, and sometimes when you pray for things, man, you got to make sure you got your, your, your dancing shoes on and be ready to move when he sent them your way. Ah, I like that. Got to be ready to move. Yes, Absolutely. Ready. Well, yeah, so I, I see on your your Twitter, you you, you put a, a verse almost every day. And and yeah. so uh, what is your approach to, to to Bible reading and and what's kind of your, your strategy and how can you maybe encourage people that, that don't necessarily get into the word every day? What, what's what's worked for you? Uh, for me, it's just um, I, I started off doing it and I just put my scriptures up, just reading, you know, put a scripture up every day. And, and then it got to the point where if I forget a day, people would be like, hey, man, what is scripture? Like, ah. you know, there's a lot of people like I wouldn't read the Bible if it wasn't for you. Wow. And I didn't know like I was doing that. So it's a way of God using using me to get his word out. And I was just like, you know, if that's the way, then OK, I'm going to do it. But I wasn't doing it for no one else. I was doing it for you know, myself, then, you know, I was like, all right, let me see, this may can touch somebody today. This may can help somebody today. And it was just, people just started looking forward to it every day. And I mean, even going back to me being hurt with my car accident injury, the day I come home from the hospital from my car accident injury, my wife finds out she had breast cancer. 
Oh so, like, I got so it's so much coming at me, like, man, what is going on? So I'm like, you know what, God, whatever it is you're trying to tell me, I'm listening. So it's like I'm just trying to figure it all out. You know, she beat cancer. She she's you know cancer free right now. So thank she God. Is. Oh, excellent. And that was one of the that was back in 2019, maybe. That was one of the trying times of testing your faith, you know, and testing your will and you know, understanding that, you know, it, it is a God, you know. It is some something bigger and, and better than what you're thinking it is out here on earth. And a lot of people think that their blessings are by what they have, like the cars. I was like, anybody can get that. Like it's it's your faith and all that comes from 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 something that is unseen. Mm. You know, if you just go outside and you look around every day, it's a miracle being shown every day. But a lot of people don't seem to want to look at that side of things. They look at, oh, he got this house, he got that car. It's like, man, you're looking at people highlights. You're not looking at actual film on what they're going through every day so you have to break things down and man just just really appreciate life and that's something that i try to tell my kids on a daily basis man just be happy for everyone because when it's your turn you're gonna want them to be happy for you that's 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 well said a absolutely well it's great news about about your wife what what about you I, I didn't i didn't ask you with the car wreck how are you feeling from that uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm up walking around i was in a wheelchair for maybe three months maybe yeah. so i got two plates and eight screws on my pelvis that's permanent um i'm able to run you know jog i can still dunk you know my players still mess with me like you can you dunk i can still do that there so i'm go. just blessed man it's just like every day i come to work they're like man why are you so happy i'm like bro i almost died gosh <laughs> like and i i got every reason in the world to be happy like so i'm just happy every day that you know i'm here you know because it could have been the other way around i mean even when my mom and my my grandmother and them came to see me in the hospital on the way home from the hospital, they get in a car accident. They get hit oh my by gosh. Truck. It was like, man, what is going on? I'm still in the in the bed, hospital bed. My mom's like, we just got hit by a truck. She's erratic, going crazy. I'm like, man, at least you can call me and talk. I'm in the hospital. I can't move. Like, you know, it's just it's just things, man. You just have to just appreciate what you have, man. Just appreciate it every day and just be thankful, like. Cause man, it's so much going on right now, but we we tend to want to get caught up in the ways of the world. And it's like even with COVID, it's like I don't think people really took what God was really trying to show them during that time. It's like you don't need much. Mm. You know, you can't do this, you can't do that, but you got family. Mm. You know, and at the end of the day, it's like you go to a restaurant, you at home most of the times, so everybody at home is on their phone. They're not even talking to each other. Gosh. It's like you got it. We got to get back to being personal with who we are and and understanding people. Like during COVID, I was like, I found out my wife don't like man sloppy joes, and I'm like, who well, don't eat sloppy joes? You know, you know what? the, the what? right. And I'm like, Come on, like but it just it just puts you back into perspective of things of like, do you really know who you are? Do you really know who you're surrounding yourself with? You know, wow. you just got time and just appreciate everything. It's like as soon as the quote unquote outside open back up they ran back outside doing the same thing it's like it's like man what what do i have to do like to show y'all that you don't need all this it's like it's all really smoke and mirrors like who are you really doing it for powerful man it's a it's a wonderful perspective and and i know for me i really slowed down during that time and want to continue that it is still right. a pull you feel the pull and even today right. I, I i i tried to cram too much in, into today but but the, just that pace of slowing down and, and allow and being able to be open to hear God speak and and Him reveal Himself and be aware of His presence and, and be aware of of those uh, around us and so that was a lesson for me. But you're right. As soon as things kind of opened up, it's like all right now. How do I fill my calendar? How do I get back I, out? Back outside. I need to do this. Yeah. I need to do that. Yeah. Like, no, you don't. Like the only thing I was happy about when when it opened back up, I was able to go back to work and go back to the office because my wife was turning me into a carpenter. I was learning how to fix everything around here. I was like, <laughs> I got to get out of here. <laughs> uh, that's funny. And so you didn't convert her into Sloppy Joes. She still nah, doesn't like I, them, huh? I didn't. I didn't ever, yeah, I wasn't I able to convert Joes. her to that. But I, that's what I said. I was like, man, who don't eat Sloppy Joes? She was like, I don't. I was like, man, that's crazy. I thought that was weird, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. That, that remind, I haven't had, had one in a while. That that, that gives me a, a hankering for a sloppy exactly. Joe. So I gotta go. Exactly. I gotta go get one. Um, well, man. Well, no, I appreciate you sharing all that. That's that's extremely encouraging and and just a, a wonderful perspective. Um, well, 
with we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with this. What does the the summer look like for you? What what's kind of going on at, at Auburn th- this summer and your role there? And and you have any family vacations coming up or what what's going on? Well, my daughter's fifteen and she's on the you know playing AAU. She's on the Nike EYBL circuit. My son is thirteen. He's playing travel baseball. So family vacations are are good right now. So we use. Um, my son, he goes to, uh, I think it's Panama, somewhere in the beach, and we use that. They go for a week, so we use that as a family vacation. Because other than that, I mean, we're pretty much gone. Like, we're having a – I usually go with my daughter with basketball. She goes with my son with baseball. And sometimes we switch up, but we don't really get to go to too many places. I think we have a foreign trip this year here at Auburn. I think we're going to Israel. We're going to go visit the Holy Land and all that stuff. So that's going to be really good. And um, Wow. We're getting back. Uh, we're just about to get back, get things rolling. I mean, people think that this is a uh, off season or downtime for us, but this is really when we really grind in, you know, with the transfer port and all that stuff. And, you know, they're really working to bring guys in. That's really just great family guys and just trying to keep this tradition, keep things rolling. I love it. Well, uh, speaking of the transfer portal and, and, and of course the NIL kind of gets thrown into the, the mix with the changing of, of college basketball, just curious, your perspective as someone involved with college basketball. And then of course, based on your, your playing career. And I don't think you had all those NIL, uh, opportunities back then on the, on the, uh, up and up, but, but what, what do you, what do you think about kind of where we're at in college basketball now? I think it's a good place. Um, it's, it's a good place and it's a bad place at the same time. Um, it's, it, it's, it's kind of hard to say what it's going to look like five to 10 years from now. I'm happy that these players are able to get compensated for what they're doing. Yeah. But I don't know if it's going to be a good thing in the future or if it's going to be bad, you know, because it's so much, it's so much gray area with everything that's going on. It's like you want what's best for the kids, but sometimes it's so much money being thrown at them and so much this different things being thrown at them that are they going to make the right decisions, you know, as far as, down the line, are they going to make some right now decisions mm. uh, instead of like, thinking about their future and understanding like, you know, you, I mean, you know, the saying all money ain't good money, but I, you can't tell a kid not to take this money and not to do that. Cause you don't know that family situation. So it's, I just don't know where it's going to be in, in a couple of years. So I, I hope it's in a good place. Like right now, I think it's, it's great that, you know, these kids are able to you know be compensated for what they're doing. Absolutely. And there, yeah, there still is that gray area, but at least, like I said, kind of the up and up, like they're just allowed to do it, which is, which right. is nice. And not trying to have to hide things and, and right. that sort of thing, which is, which is great. But sorry, I got one more thing. So just kind of, I'm curious your, how your perspective on money changed over the years. And, and even, you know, if you think back to when you were coming out into the NBA, you of course were undrafted. Um, <laughs> But but thinking like how do you relate to the current players and, and kind of what lessons do you teach them as they're preparing to to go to the next level and, and, and making money that most people never ever have made before that? They're, right now they're they're making a lot more money than what you know was we were making and we were making a lot more money than when Michael Jordan and those guys came out. So, you know, you wanna be thankful that you're a part of, you know, setting the trend and, and allowing these guys to make more money, be able to take care of their families. Um uh, I just uh, one thing I, I tell our players here is like, man, get you somebody to watch the person that's watching your money. Ah, you know, I always make sure you got at least two eyes on your money. So if someone was to do something, somebody else can come in and be like, hey, you need to watch them. So I always try to just make sure somebody's watching what somebody else is doing. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, especially young athletes, you know, they they come in and they just want to play basketball, or football, or whatever the sport it is that they're doing, and they don't think about the money side of things. They they know it's there but they don't know where it's going, who it's going to. And, you know, and, and try not to handicap your friends and your family, you know. Um, if they want to be around, you know, put them in school, have them doing something that's going to benefit them as well as you at the same time instead of you always having to dig in your pockets and give them money. That's, that's a wonderful advice. I, I love that. Well, Marquise, man, this has been a, a treat and, and a lot of fun having you on the show and, and appreciate your uh, – your honesty and, and vulnerability and, and a lot of great stories and encouragement. So, uh, man, appreciate it. Wish you the best you. with Auburn and uh, enjoy the rest of the NBA playoffs. Uh, thank you. You too. All right. I appreciate right. it. There's Marquise Daniels, former NBA player, joining us here on the Unpacking It podcast presented by MediShare.